Hello, and welcome to the From Toxic to Healthy, Healthy Relationships Masterclass Series. I'm your host, Jen Youngquist, and today I'm speaking with intuitive dating and relationship coach, Emilia Nagy. Welcome, Amelia, and thank you for being part of this important conversation. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're very welcome. Amelia, can you start out by telling people who you are and what it is that you do and maybe a little bit about what got you on that path? Yeah. Well, I'm a woman that's 42 years old. <laughs> I live in San Diego with my soulmate, Emil, and our six-year-old daughter and our Rottweiler, Bernie, and we're going on 10 years in our marriage, and I feel really grateful and happy that I have a healthy, what I call sacred partnership, a partnership where my husband and I both feel like one plus one is not two, like one plus one is like 500. And that was my goal. I wanted to break the cycle that I was raised with. I was dating the wrong men. Um, I was, I had fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression, insomnia. I was constantly in toxic relationships, attracting narcissistic people. And um, at one point I even thought about ending my life because I was so lonely and could not experience fulfillment from my relationships. I always seemed to be in really painful relationships. And the turning point really came when I decided to really work on what I could do, like what was in my power, what could I heal, what could I change. And I met my mentor and coach, which is Allison Armstrong, and that was like 12 years ago. And I started taking her courses and learning with her and doing the self-empowerment work. And eventually I was able to heal that blueprint, the blueprint of basically a toxic relationship, which is what was comfortable and familiar, even though it was painful. So that's always what I went to because that was the blueprint. That was the, the foundation of what I had learned growing up. And yeah, I'm so glad that I did the work. It's a thousand percent worth it. Um, and now I help other, I help primarily women um, work through that cycle and heal, change that blueprint, then learn how to date discerningly, and then learn how to partner powerfully with a healthy man who's got their back and who sees them and who wants to be there for them and wants to be their hero. And that's the work that I do. Yes, we all want and need that. Yes. So there are, there's many different kinds of toxic relationships, but I think that it seems like narcissism is pretty rampant and there seems to be a spectrum of that, you know, from someone that's kind of just, you know, a little bit selfish <laughs> to someone who's full on, you know, wanting to squash the people around them. And mm -hmm. you have a pretty simple definition of a narcissist. Can you share that with us? Yeah. And I just want to say, this is from my research from five years of leading narcissistic abuse recovery groups here live in San Diego and online. So, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. So the, the simplicity of it is that it is somebody who is willing to meet their needs at the expense of someone else. Like that's the foundation. They're willing to meet their needs at the expense of someone else. Another, another way of saying that is that as long as it works for them, they are not accountable for the harm that they might cause with their actions. They're not, they don't wanna see what that, the harm might be causing. They don't wanna be accountable for it. And they're not capable of being accountable for it. And that is what I think is at the core of all toxic relationships. I often say that you narcissism is, if someone's physically abusing you, that's still narcissism, right? The, 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 if somebody's financially abusing you, that's still narcissism. So the, the specific thing with narcissism in and of itself, when there's the absence of the physical proof, as in nobody's hitting you, nobody's financially stealing your money, but it, the bruises are on the inside, the emotional bruises are on the inside, and nobody else can see 
and that person appears like a charming pillar in the community, that's when it gets complicated and, and gnarly with the, the recovery because a lot of us go through a process that we call cognitive dissonance, which is this com complete and utter self doubt that this is actually happening because things there's no proof on the outside so that's where you know the narcissism gets gnarly when it's done in such a subverted and passive way that you, there's no outside proof in anything that this is this kind of abuse is kind of emo emotional and I, I would definitely go as far as to say spiritual abuse is occurring. I think that's a very um, important point because I think a lot of times that we, if it's not physical, we discount our own gut. Yes. And, and I think sometimes it also maybe is a little bit shameful. And so we don't really want to acknowledge it. Yeah, absolutely. It's very scary and very shameful. And we, 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 we feel shame that we are going through it. We think we're alone. We think we're crazy. Oftentimes the pe person who is abusing us is telling us those things. They're telling us we're crazy or that it didn't happen or they're intellectualizing our feelings. And so we learn to doubt ourselves and put ourselves down because that's what they're doing, especially if we grew up in that kind of family system. So it is, it is important and it is, it's important to point that out, that just because there's no evidence doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. And it doesn't always just happen with a, in a, within a romantic relationship. So this can also be family members that are, you know, narcissistic or at least on that spectrum. And that can cause us, you know, a lot of confusion growing up. Um, I think that, you know, it, you have a little bit of a, a personal story with that, that maybe some people in the audience might resonate with. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of us, right, when we move into our life, and we become adults, and we embark on the journey of expressing ourselves in the world and making a contribution with our gifts and which all of us want to do we all have that inner heart desire for those of us that have had a, a blueprint in our upbringing that tells us that we're unworthy or that we can't do that or that we um will never have a healthy relationship because we don't know what that's like then it's definitely can keep us from creating fulfillment in our lives, not just in our romantic relationships, but in all areas at work. Um, you know, like even with just like the person in the grocery store, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's something that can keep us feeling small and um, like we have nothing to offer. And that's why the work I think is so important so that we can, come out of hiding with ourselves, come out of the shame with ourselves. Um, for me, I was raised in communist Bulgaria. And so the, 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 the political system in, in and of itself, and I actually see that happening now here in the United States, which is very scary, um, was abusive. The political system itself was emotionally and psychologically and spiritually abusive to the people. And so then what I believe happened is that that those people were raised that way. They were raised without a sense of a divine connection because you weren't allowed to go to church. You weren't allowed to explore that part. So you were supposed to depend on the state, depend on the government for your needs. But the gov government like subverted you and humiliated you and put you down and told you you're not worthy. And so then I think people internalized that, internalized that and it came out in the culture, it came out in the families. Um, and also narcissism can happen under a plethora of circumstances, which, you know, that that's something I can go into a little bit later if you want. But so I think I was raised in that kind of culture. And I think that's the modeling that was given to my family, my mom and dad, I think that's what they did. And unfortunately, it's, not good <laughs> it's not helpful it's not it doesn't allow us to 
create a fulfilling life and create value for others. And also it's very conflict inducing. It's very com conflict inducing. I remember in my twenties when I was in love with a guy that I thought I would marry that had a lot of narcissistic traits, like the silent treatment, um, just getting upset for, for little things, um, objectifying me and my needs and my wants. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm always fighting with him. I'm always trying to get him to see and, and, and to understand my point of view and to understand the, the consequences of his actions. And that never happened. And I remember that moment. I was like, this is, this is very familiar. Like where, how come this is familiar? And I realized that, well, this is what the model I was given. This is what I thought was love. So thankfully I was able to leave that relationship. But I remember thinking, I'll never be a force for peace and love in the world if I stay here. I'll never be able to do my mission. I'll never be the healer. In my heart then, I didn't even know that I was a healer that I am. But I knew, I knew what I didn't know. You know what I mean? Like in the way that we know. Yeah. And I remembered that that, that decision to leave and how hard it was. And I remember having a friend who encouraged me and supported me at that time and how valuable that was. And I remember going back 10 years later and going to that apartment and taking a photo with my arms up and just feeling so victorious that I did walk away because that changed the trajectory of my entire life. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience. It, it took me way too long to recognize that I deserved better and way too long to work up that courage to leave. And part of it was because I didn't feel like anyone else would want me. <laughs> I really didn't. And um, that's what one of the things that kept me stuck for so long in that relationship. And I think that a lot of people maybe go through something really similar where you don't, you know, you maybe knew you had another contribution to make, but I didn't. Um, it took me a really long time to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> and so trying to, to work through all of that, um, especially being really young and not having a, a good relationship model. Um, yeah. You know, I had no idea what a, what a healthy relationship even was supposed to look like. Um, so it was really difficult to get out of that. But once I did, thank goodness, I didn't ever look back. And, um, you know, I never really missed him once, <laughs> once I moved on, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't really miss that abuse you took and you don't really realize how bad it was until you actually get out. And then you're like, oh my gosh, why did I put up with that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We don't miss it. We don't miss it. Right, right. That's so I, I never heard anyone say that they regretted leaving. Everyone says that they wish they had left sooner. Yeah, yeah, totally. There are, it's, it's much harder to leave when the relationship is, say, a parent. Do yes. you have any advice for, like, someone that has a parent or maybe both that have some of these tendencies um you know how do you be in relationship with them or is it best to just cut them off yeah well i first want to say that it's a very difficult and and complicated decision and it's a personal decision that everyone i believe does need to everyone that is being emotionally abused in their by a family member that's a very valid thing to think about and consider is, you know, we call it going no contact. And it is really important to give yourself that opportunity to really think about that option, because that option for many people is the thing that catalyzes their healing. And so it's very difficult for people who um, are not able to take that option because maybe it's their ex and they're co-parenting um, or like in a parent where they're dependent on you. So it's, it's a very complicated and very rare choice, um, but definitely I see the no contact catalyzing a lot of healing and it definitely did for me. It allowed me to really come into my own and to own who I am as a person 
and it used to be where I would just fly into rages, like in crying rages would last for days, panic attacks just from dealing with family members. And now it's like they just if they if that happens, which is rare, it's just like, OK, well, that was annoying. <laughs> you know, like it's not it doesn't have that effect anymore. Are you still no contact with your narcissistic parent? Nope. I'm not no contact. I'm I have contact. Um, I want them to have that, you know, their grandkid and I want them to enjoy time with their grandkid. And I also see that the relationship dynamic is so different. Um, like in my family, I know that my dad experienced being very narcissistically abused by his mom. So my grandma, but my relationship with my grandma was one of the healthiest in my family. So I think the dynamics can be very different between children and grandchildren, or at least it was in my family. Um, but, you know, there are signs. I write about it on my blog. There is a level of, um, you know, a person who has those emotional wounds and hasn't healed them yet, and that those are things that lead them to behaving, having those narcissistic traits. You know, it's hard for them to be as present. It's hard for them to be as emotionally tuned in. It's hard for them to be confident that they're making the right choices and so you know I would say like you can see with my daughter because she's a child the effects of that like you can see her feeling less secure or um, getting getting irritable in that environment so it's it's really neat to see like it's not that I, not that she's going through harm it's like she she's learning about being in those kinds of relationships and that's a good thing you know I believe, you know, a lot of people say, like, I actually have had people attack me, like, how could you, you should be no contact. And it's like, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's what I, that's not what I want. And that's not what's healthy for my family. But there's definitely boundaries. And thank God for those. Yes. <laughs> so did it take you a while to work up the courage to institute those boundaries and to be able to stick to them and, and not feel guilty about it? Yeah, it definitely did. Um, there was definitely a period of gaslighting. I remember a conversation. <laughs> I give this as an example sometimes because it's so funny. It's so. T I remember a conversation one time with my dad where it was like, you know, you have to come visit us, and and it's this, and why didn't you come last weekend? And and then that, and the a month ago when you came, you were late, and then the month before that, you forgot this, <laughs> you know, and then I, I was like well, I'll let you know when I'm available or like I was putting those boundaries in the phone call. And I remember he was like, uh, what are you, what, what? Like that, I hear boundaries. <laughs> like that was what, what came on the other, when the other line was like, I hear boundaries. What is this? What are these boundaries? I sense some boundaries happening. And I was like, yeah yeah there's i'm uh, good oh my god you're sensing boundaries oh my god you need a birthday cake like congratulations so it was that kind of moment where it was like you know i remember the shock of it right and i remember just going yes there are boundaries and you have to respect them and you know getting off the call but yeah those relationships caused me so much drama and so much unhappiness and self-doubt and loss of self-worth for so many years you know so um it was hard to put in the boundaries but like you said once I started putting them in the payoff was so huge that I just kept going even though it was hard even though it was hard it was like I know this is the right thing I know this is the healthy thing for me and my family and then once I, I met my husband and started dating him I noticed the effects on me when I would be around my family that I would become insecure and snappy and irritable. And sometimes I would have panic, like panic attacks. And, and then he had to deal with me. And then it was like, and he did an amazing job, by the way, he was so compassionate and so understanding and so loving and so kind. Um, but it was like, I didn't want to bring that into what we had that was so beautiful. So that was another motivator for me putting in boundaries of like, wow, I really want to protect what we have in the sacredness of it and the beauty and the health of it. And I don't want to be my worst self. 
and I know what makes me show up as my worst self. So I'm not going to engage in that. So you had that self-realization of, well, when I'm around them, then I am this way that I don't want to be. And so then that prompted you to want to keep those boundaries and, and institute those and, and enforce them. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah. I don't regret it at all. I do have to say I wasn't always kind about it and I wasn't always honoring about it. Um, but I have to say that I am forgiving myself for not being kind and forgiving myself for not being honor honoring only just further commits me to having the boundaries <laughs> because then I realize, wow, I can forgive myself for not, not giving, not being the best I could be and the kindness and the most honoring for them and their experience. Uh, but this is exactly why I need boundaries, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Boundaries are great. I love boundaries. Yeah. I think that the biggest thing that helped me with that was a lot of this, just repressed rage I had from growing up. I, I basically used that, all that anger, <laughs> I brought it up to the surface and I used that to really keep people, you know, especially my parents in check. And, and there were other people that were overstepping boundaries too, because for a while there, um, I didn't feel like I had a lot of worth and therefore I was kind of a doormat which you know sometimes happens after you know yeah. you've been through a childhood of you know abuse and you know when you have parents that have their own issues um so yeah I, I used that rage <laughs> it, it's to, in a somewhat healthy and productive way but I also kind of let it get out of hand and it came through in other areas of my life like um, I was a big road rager for a while, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know how to kind of harness that and to know when to use it and, and when not to. Um, do you have any advice for people that might be, you know, feeling a lot of that? What's so funny, because as you're talking, I'm thinking about Mr. Miyagi, wipe on, wipe off. <laughs> and the reason is because nobody, nobody is very effective with rage. Rage is protective energy, right? Rage is, when you think about what rage is, it is our animal part, because we have an animal side and a human side, so human animal, human spirit. And if you think about human animal, it's like we're protecting our boundaries, we're protecting our space, we're protecting our our home, our, our freedom, whatever it is that we're protecting. So it makes sense to me that we would have rage, right? Like it may, that that's what we would have if someone was attacking our home or our safety, right? And so I think the first thing is to really honor that, like really honor that because you have rage, there's nothing wrong with you. Like I remember one time my mom, like I was mad. My mom did something that crossed my boundary again. And I remember being really mad about it. Um, and I remember like sending an email, like, don't do this again. This is not good. Never do it. Right. And then the response was like, um, well, obviously therapy isn't working because you're still angry. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, but at that point it was working because I, I could own and honor that I was right to be angry, that I had a right to be angry. So for anybody that's struggling with that, I would say you have a right to be angry. So rather than like saying, why am I so angry? Something's wrong with me uh, because I'm angry. Try, wow, what if I have a right to be angry? Like if I have a right to be angry, what would I be angry about? So I think that's the first stage. And I think that wipe on, wipe off came into my mind because you know, that when, when Daniel did his training with Mr. Miyagi, that was about channeling his energy effectively and precisely and efficiently, but we never start that way. And so it's the same with rage. It's like, once you understand that energy, that you understand that it's a very valuable part of our survival force and our survival force is our human animal. That part of us is so powerful. It's not something to shame or disown or, or call the ego or call it the flesh. That part of us, like, I just want to give this example. Like I'm, I'm on my bike with my two year old and I fall 
and my human animal, that part of me knew what to do. My She wrapped her body all around my child. My child never hit the pavement. I don't know how she did this. She did like some octopus gymnastics while falling, right? And that's our human animal. And so when you think about that intelligence and power that isn't logical, you want to own that. You want to own that, like, yeah, I'm angry for a reason. Why am I angry? There must be a reason. Like, so what is that reason? And allow yourself to be, be, be with that permission. Give yourself permission and give yourself compassion and understanding that there's probably a good reason why you're angry. And then from there, there's a multiple ways we could channel that. Uh, for me, I, I decided to channel into flamenco. I went to Spain and I studied flamenco and flamenco is very passionate. And I think the beauty about really owning our rage is that the opposite of rage is passion. So when we suppress our rage, we actually suppress our passion. When we suppress our rage, we suppress our life force. We suppress our life force. And so it's really a powerful beautiful thing to own our age and i i recommend that we approach it with honor with willingness and with curiosity i think it's a very powerful part of who we are as human beings and i i i kind of love it i kind of love it now yes i yeah it, it helped get me out of out of a tough spot and i think one way that I was able to diffuse it was with compassion and empathy, not just for myself, but for other people. Um, you know, because I grew up in a house full of rage and I realized that I was kind of heading down that path. And so Mm -hmm. I had to, you know, be compassionate with myself first and then, having empathy for other people, you know, say, especially since I was a big road rager and if someone, you know, cut me off or whatever, then I just had to empathize with that person that, well, maybe they have somewhere to be and, you know, leave it at that. So it, it helped diffuse it a little bit there. Yeah. Can I, I just wrote a little short poem about it last night. Can I read it? Absolutely. So it's called The Rage. Many women are afraid to feel rage. Rage is so priceless, it's sacred, and it's so needed. Because on the other side of rage is passion. If you suppress your rage, you suppress your passion. If you suppress your fire, you suppress your creativity. If you suppress your rage, you lose your power. Do not suppress your rage. And I even suggest in this poem, in this blog that I was working on that, what if we could direct that fire towards our will for recovery? What if we could direct that fire towards our resolve to get help? What if we could direct that fire to our resolve to move through this as quickly and as with as much support as possible? That's a powerful way to redirect the rage, I think. Yes, that's a beautiful way to think about it. And that really is kind of what, you know, you do with people, right? You help them to, um, you know, basically transform who they were into who they, you know, are becoming, I suppose, or or who they want to be um, in order to, you know, have the better relationships and, and to heal themselves. Um, I don't know if there was a question in there. <laughs> I guess it was more or less. Like- I do. I do. And I, for a lot of people, the first stage is owning the human animal aspect of ourselves and not shaming ourselves and guilting ourselves for it. Because then when we do that, of course, we suppress it. And then we su- when we suppress it, all the things that I described happen. So we can't, you know, we can't move into our power by disowning our, what, you know, our shadow or our dark aspects or the things that are not comfortable. We re- we really just can't because those things are, they're part of us and they're important and we need them and we don't want to like leave them at the side of the road. <laughs> so yeah. the, the work is really to uh, integrate them into our being and be, you know, really just feel whole and be able to 
be free and, and make our own, have our own opinions and our own decisions and have a connection to our own self, knowing what we want and desire. And the results of that is really living a powerful creative life, like being able to use your creativity, use your personal power to manifest things. Like I just manifested the awesomest walk-in closet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, it's just, that's the, that's the, there's so many gifts to actually going through the recovery. The recovery is hard. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's not, it's easy, but of course it can be so much easier with support and with guidance. So that's the reasons why we do these things, right? So we want people to know that there's us out there that help with this kind of thing. Like you're not alone. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So one more point I want to make, and it's more of a practical issue for those that maybe can't um, go no contact with their toxic person in their life. You have tips on like, especially if they are, you know, having to raise a child with this person or, you know, like in your case, they, you know, have a, a child and that's their grandparents. How do you make sure your child is safe throughout the whole relationship? Well, what I came to for myself and what I tell parents is that when we are healthy, then we can be that safe harbor. We can never protect our kids from the world. Or if we do, then we're controlling and abusive. And that's what happens, right? And so... The goal isn't that we keep them from the experiences that life has for them. The goal is that we be whole and, and healthy and able to help ourselves and them get through it. Life is hard. There's hard things about life and then life is just as hard as it is. There's just as much beauty. And so my, my, my advice that I always tell parents is, the healthier you are, the healthier your kids will be. And yes, maybe they have a narcissistic other parent, but they have one healthy parent. And I've seen it where with people that have that healthy parent, that person that's okay, that person that is not emotionally abusive, that person that can give them the emotional support that they need, the kids actually turn out good. They have somebody. They, they, they deal with the issue. Like I have a friend that, you know, their kids are, she, they dealt with the issue. It hurt them. They cried when their dad would guilt them. Like, you don't come see me. You don't do enough. They, it was hard, but she was there to be like, your dad's having problems and he's actually, it's actually not okay that he takes it out on you. And I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And they, they, they grew up great. Like they're doing great. And so that's the power of us doing our healing because then we're not reactive. We're the safe harbor. We're the place they go to when life gets hard. And if they have a, a, another narcissistic parent, then life is going to get hard for them. But we, we can't, it's, I don't think it's our job to take them away from that. It's our job to support them in dealing with that and learning how to deal with that because they're going to have that in life. They might have a narcissistic boss or they might end, end up. So, so it's, so that's, I think the best thing we can do. And, and people who are still in those relationships we were, we were talking about before. It's like, if you are in that toxic relationship, everyone has always said, I've never heard anybody say, I think one time, actually, I do remember one woman said it, but it was for a different reason. So like 99.9% .9 of the time, it's, oh my God, I'm so glad I left. I should have done it sooner. My kids are way better off. I'm better off. Everything is way better off. So for anyone that's stuck in doubting the experience for 99.9% .9 of people is like, oh my God, thank God I did it. Thank God my kids now have a, a chance for healthy experiences and healthy relationships and they're not under that trauma and distress and I can get healthy too. I think so that's, that's what I say about that. Yeah, that's a, a great point because I don't think that we are generally taught how to deal with our emotions as children. I, I think if we were, you know, we would come out a lot better, a lot more well-adjusted to, life 
So good point of, you know, if you isolate them from this and don't let them learn how to work through it and process it, it could actually be more harm in the long run. Yeah, and that's the power of having the boundaries, but also I think the huge, amazing motivation for us doing our work is that then we get to break that cycle. We get to break that cycle. We get to break that cycle because if we do the work and raise our children not in that cycle, then that, that cycle is broken in our family line. Yes. So it's a really powerful thing to, to do that. And I think the other piece about that that I really celebrate in my life is like the, 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 the thing that's important is that because I did that work and remember I told you how I would get triggered and fl fly into rages and now it's just like getting annoyed occasionally. Well, can you imagine if my child had to deal with a mom who was triggered and flying into rages? Hmm. Like, thank God she doesn't have to worry about me on top of what might be happening to, for her, right? So that's another huge motivator for us to do our work and do our part and, and heal because we can. This is what I say all the time. This is a problem. It's gnarly, but it has a solution. You can heal. You can move through. You can not just survive, but thrive. And believe it or not, there are gifts in that. There's so many gifts from going through the journey of recovery. There's so many gifts. Absolutely. And we are proof of that. <laughs> well, thank you, Amelia, so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. Would you like to tell viewers where they can find you and if you have anything coming up? Yeah, so you can find me at womanworthyoflove.com. Woman, one woman, womanworthyoflove.com. And I have blogs on there and you can read, you know, I talk about grief. I talk about a lot of these topics. Um, but also there's a, this thing called the right, how to pick the right guy checklist. So if you've been in a toxic relationship and you're sick of attracting the wrong men and you want to break the cycle and attract what I call sacred partnership, then that is a great thing that I offer. It's free. You just go in there and put in your email and you can download the right guy checklist, how to pick the right guy checklist. So that's, um, and you can, you'll stay in touch with me with that because you'll go on my mail list and you'll get my messages. So you'll know what I'm doing from there, whether it's events or other interviews, podcasts, things like that. Awesome. Wish I had that about 10 years ago. <laughs> so thank you, Amelia, for being here today and being a part of this important discussion. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your time and dedication to this very, very important topic in our world today. I think it's really important that we look at this and that we do our own healing. I really believe that the, the personal is the collective. What we're going through on a personal level reflects in our collective consciousness, in our world, through our governments, through our politics. And so us doing our inner personal work, that heals the planet. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thanks, Jen. Bye. Bye.